Hey, everybody. How you doing? This is Jim Grisanzio from Oracle, and welcome back to JFocus 2020. And I'm here with Jose Poma and Morris Naftalin, two Java champions. I got two Java champions tonight. Hey, guys, welcome to the program. Thank you. Good Thank to be you, here. Jim. It's nice to meet you here for the first time, even though we're digital. Um, I always like to meet people for the first time, actually, physically. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, 2021. We're extending the experience of, you know, 2020. Um, so, um, you know, Matias wanted us to have some conversations here with some of the speakers at the, um, at the conference. I was at JFocus last year. And it was a fantastic event. It was a really, really uh, strong event, you know, technically as well as, you know, culturally. And so um, it's great that they're actually running sessions, uh, you know, this year as well. So a um, couple of things I want to talk about, just maybe your session. I was, I was looking at some of your YouTube videos and you guys do a session together, something about the sincerest form of flattery. So somebody's ripping off some, something from somebody, I would imagine. Um, and uh, talk a little bit about the community and, uh, and you know, Java along the way. So um, let's start off with your session. What are you guys talking about? Well, the reason that uh, the session got called the sincerest form of flattery is because uh, in, it's a saying in English that imitation is a sincerest form of flattery. And uh, I, it, was actually, it actually came from a, from a session that I went to at uh, Jcrete uh, a couple of years ago when Remy Forax, a friend of uh, Jose's, was talking about the three features that um, many years ago, people in the functional programming community thought that Java could learn from functional programming. And over the years, it's, and, and I was learning Scala at the time, and uh, I saw those three features had got into Scala much more quickly than they got into Java. And I thought it would be interesting to take a look at how functional programming, these, these very uh, interesting and positive features of functional programming have gradually been adopted into Java and how that differs from the way that they got into Scala without its um, payload of uh, backward compatibility that it's had to carry behind it. Yes, that, that's so we, 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 we made a talk on this subject also at the DevOx France. The talk is available on YouTube, but it's in French, so you need to understand French if you want to follow that talk. Hey, but uh, I got your the, name uh, just a few minutes ago. I got your name, okay, right? So... <laughs> A little bit of French Absolutely. there. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, and yes, that, that, that was the idea of this. It was, it's a very lengthy talk. It's a three hours talk. And uh, we spent about one hour on each topic, uh, basically. And uh, it's, it's really, it's also, I think, that the idea behind that is to show that those new and shiny ideas that are coming in the JDK uh, are, in fact, implementations of things that people have been thinking about for years. And this is, this is also in reference to a talk by, uh, by Brian Goetz, who is, who is just saying that, that, that functional programming and object-oriented programming shouldn't be put just in front of each other to fight, but to, to bring more, more new ideas to, to, the, to the language and to improve the, J, the JDK on the overall, in fact. Yeah, so Java has been around for, you know, 25 years now. So, I mean, yeah. from what you're saying, I mean, there's a lot of evolution here. There's a lot of influences from developers and other languages, from other languages and just, you know, just natural evolution. Things have to evolve. Um, it, it, this is a normal process in technology, right? Yeah, very much, very much, very much so. Um, the 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 problem for Java has been that it, it has been that it's placed placed a very high value on backward compatibility right. and introducing new features and evolving a technology becomes more and more difficult. The more technology there is to continue to live with, and they've done a fantastic job of ensuring that programs, even really, really old Java programs, can still run on mo modern Java uh, compilers and interpreters. And that's very unusual for a language as, uh, as, as complex as Java with the, with the um, uh, number of features that it has. So it's hard work for, to introduce a new feature into Java now, but, it's st but they're still doing it. So um, I used to work at Sun, and I remember this whole concept of backward compatibility was, I mean, it was just in the hallways. I mean, you know, in Solaris and Java, you just, you can feel it, you know. Um, and how, how, are, how are developers, how do developers embrace 
change um, and evolution uh, because Java today is not Java of uh, you know 20 or 25 years ago. It's not so much. Well, the, the, I don't know. So many of them do experience change. A huge number of the developers that are using Java now have actually come to it very recently. Yeah. So for many of them, there actually isn't that much change. They're saying they're they're they're, they're really puzzled as to why there are these differences in features between languages. The, the, the it's, it's it's quite odd, in fact, to realize that we we are both with Maurice old developers. Well, Maurice, of course, is much older than than, than I am. But I'm a very old developer. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not so, that young either. <laughs> so you guys have certainly uh, in experienced. Fact, in, in fact, when when you take when you take newcomers to the language, yeah. take, take for instance one of the last big things that was introduced in in Java eight was the lambda expressions, but in fact the people that are uh, going out from university or, or engineering schools, they, they, they have been trained with Lambda expressions. So, so they don't even know that there was, they don't even realize that there was a time before the introduction of Lambda expressions in Java. Uh, and that, that's, that's just it. It has been introduced six years ago. Uh, it takes about three years to train an engineer at, at this year in France. Uh, so so that's, that's just half the time. Uh, and, now, and now people are just trained by that. And it, for them, it's just natural. So when you say Java is evolving, they don't have the same, they don't think the same, uh, they don't have the same ideas in their mind when, when you tell that to them. When you are telling them, oh yes, but there was a time before, before Lambda was there, for them it's completely abstract. They don't even understand what you're saying. And that, that's, that's really very odd to realize that, in fact. <laughs> okay, so one of the things I realized when I was looking at your videos is that they're very long and very, very comprehensive. And so, um, you have a, you, you must have a mixed audience in terms of ages. So how do you explain these concepts then when you get some people who are new and just you mentioned that, you know, why are you talking about this? And some of the guys who are a little bit older and who have actually experienced this evolution. Hmm. They, they, may, they may also have experienced that from other languages because hmm. one of the aspects of the talk is that we are talking of not only about Java, but other languages also. Uh, some of them were developed, like uh, Pizza was developed 20 years ago, Maurice, I think is that, that's about that. Right, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't know if the language is a lot, used a lot anymore now, but still there are people remembering that and, and uh, that, is, that are interested in the, in the history of the evolution of those ideas. The issue of mixed audiences is really a problem. You have to estimate um, in conference talks, I have no idea how we do how you can do that with um, with uh, videos online like YouTube videos. But for conference talks, you know something about the audience for that conference, yeah. and you make a guess. And generally speaking, your expectation is that the first half or so of the of the talk will be comprehensible to everybody, and then you're just going to have to accept that you may lose people in the second half because you want to tell the people who are more expert something about uh, that they don't know already. And conference organizers tend to tend to be helpful about this because sometimes they'll classify the co the, the talks as basic or intermediate. And but generally speaking, it's quite hit and miss. Right. And you know, actually, whether people enjoy conference talks or not depends doesn't depend only on whether they understand them. There's a very uh, it's very important what the entertainment value is. So the personality of the speaker and the entertainment they're prepared to offer are actually just as important in terms of in terms of getting acceptance as a conference speaker as actually having good technical content. I'm right. sorry to. I don't know if you should be sorry about that because I think it's just reality, you know? Um, and, yeah. you know, that is a technique. Well, it's not tech. It's just one of the ways you deliver content um, is, is through having an engaging, you know, speaker, um, you know? So, um, okay. So with the sincerest form of flattery talk, what, what can developers expect when they hear you uh, talk about it at J focus? A good laugh. <laughs> well, we hope so. In, in the first few minutes. So, you, so you're going to show the monkey there as well? You can show the monkey? Oh, don't, 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 don't give don't away our that. best joke. <laughs> <laughs> they can expect to get a perspective on why um, certain features in Java look the way they do, which is sometimes, sometimes puzzling and sometimes irritating. Uh, and 
if they are interested in Scala, they can have a comparison with, with, with Scala and they can look forward to new features that are going to appear in, in, in Java in the near future. Cool. Okay. So let's shift gears and talk about the community here because um, I mentioned in the opening that uh, you're both uh, Java champions. And um, so that is, you know, a community, you know, a group of people. Um, and you're going to, so you're going to present that, at you know, J Focus, which is itself a community um, of you know people go there year after year after year, and this sort of you know you know you know you know, creates a you know, bit of a you know culture. Um, and you were talking about J Crete and you know, J Alba; um, those are other you know, conferences, but they're also you know, have their own personality and community. And then you have the larger Java community as well. You know the Meta Java community, uh, which is. I don't know, millions and millions and millions of, mm. of people around the world at all kind of ages and everything. Uh, and so you guys have sort of, you yourself have evolved. You've been around for a while. So, so let's talk about the community for a few minutes. Um, what, what do you get out of working within an open source, open source, open source uh, community? Um, so the, the, I, I, I think that I've been, I've been involved in communities for quite a number of years. I think I, I, I attended my first Paris Java user group event like 10 years ago or something, maybe a little more. And uh, I've been recruited by the, by the, the members of the Paris Jug at that time to, uh, to take care of the, the nonprofit association that is, that is handling the, the, the organizations of the, the gatherings. And I've also been part of the, the, the organization of DevOx France, uh, the first three years of, of, the, of the conference. And uh, my last uh, <laughs> creation, <laughs> Paris Jug creation, was uh, J Chateau last year, which is also an, uh, an unconference on the model of J Crete and uh, J Alba. I've attended J Crete once and uh, J Alba twice, I think. Was it? Yeah. I didn't miss any editions. I, I think it was, it was three, two times. Uh, that I that made the travel to Edinburgh, yeah, and I had such a fantastic experience that I, I thought that yeah, it would it would be really interesting to have this kind of event also in France. And uh, I, I think that the community is, uh, you know, when when you listen to economists, they would explain you that the Ponzi pyramid is a system that cannot work, and precisely what we are showing with with. Uh, the, the Java communities and the, the computer computer languages communities in general, and the open source communities is that in that case precisely the Ponzi pyramid is working. The more you give, and the more you get, and it's true for open source. It's true for for talks and conferences and and events like Jugs. The more you get, the, the more you give, and the more people are going to come. And, and everyone, in fact, is bringing something, uh, bringing something that that person can bring. So it could just be some kind of discussion around around the coffee at the coffee break. It could be a talk. It could be a return of experience, really anything. In unconferences, it can be discussions about soft skills that are absolutely not technical. And that that works incredibly well. So yes, that that's I think that, that that's the point of being involved in in, uh, in the community. The, the people who are who begin to come to the, this kind of event uh, most of the time, keep coming and coming again, coming back, and uh, sometimes they end up organizing stuff. And, uh, and that, that's really the, how I, I live those things. And, and I think it, it makes you really a, a better person in, in many aspects. Maybe, Maurice, you have a same kind of experience. Well, yeah, not not so strongly as you really, but but it, but recently it has it has worked for me. So I mean, um, my I, I think probably the biggest thing that I've contributed to the community in the last uh, few years has been J Alba, which I started really because I just enjoyed J Crete, and I don't, can't even remember yeah. now uh, how it was that um, that I got. I let myself in, as I would say, for uh, for organising the same thing in Edinburgh. Um, what I th what I think is really interesting about that is that if you've been to both J Crete and J Arbor, these are unconferences, which are quite unlike 
um, conferences like JFocus because they're self-organizing. The, all that the organizers for, or the disorganizers for an unconference do right. is they provide the venue and they provide local arrangements and places to eat and that sort of thing. But they don't actually organize the talks. And the talks, the choice of talks and the content of the talks is chosen just by the participants. There's no program committee or anything like that. And, uh, and, and I've actually have found that, I've found that really interesting experience to, to be doing that. Um, it, it, essentially, I've really felt like a lot of support from the people, the people who come. They're, they're, there's no way that you can come to an unconference and just be a passive observer. You have to, you have to really take part. And I've really enjoyed seeing people working together, which is always a pleasure, in making an event that is, that is, that is good for all of them. And I feel like what I've done has really been just really as a, a facilitator. I've just kind of provided the, sort of made sure the building was booked and that the, and the buses turned up on time. But the actual event itself was made by people working together. And when you give people a chance to work together, you know, they, they, don't, need, they don't need managers and authority figures and so on. They just will get together and they'll do stuff. And that is really, uh, that's very exciting to see. Yeah, I've participated in and actually in many on conferences. Um, actually, going back ten years ago to you know, Tokyo Bar Camp um, you know, here in Japan, um, and I've been involved with Unvox Hawaii in recent years. And we, you know, even at the Oracle, you know, Code One and you know, Oracle Open World in San Francisco, we do an unconference there as well. Uh, and it, it is, you know, you mentioned it, Morris, actually quite well in the sense of if you just bring people into a space and give them, a, you know, just a rough framework, um, sometimes the shyest people just all of a sudden blossom and they're out there presenting, you know, uh, or organizing, which is really just as important. Um, and I always found in all these situations, um, the sort of... Um, the hallway, so the whole event essentially is a hallway conversation, right? Um, yes. And, and there's yeah. a lot sure. of, everyone breaks out their laptops and sometimes they don't break out their laptops, but they're talking. And the conversations can get very deep, very, very quickly. Obviously, it depends who you have in the room, right? Um, and then the conversations continue into the social events, um, you know, at dinners and, you know, things like that. Um, but for me, the community is... You know what you mentioned. What you mentioned in Jose is like, you know, people are contributing, right? And it it's if you're sort of you know on the outside, you feel like you're on the outside. Get involved in an open source community or an unconference. The contribution itself is valued, and other people can see that. And that's not necessarily true in a corporate structure, right? Um, and it it's 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 very very a very very a powerful thing. Um, and so that's why I wanted to mention it because the Java community is, is so big and so diverse and um, it's gone through so many changes over the years uh, with all these different conferences now. So I um, wanted to get your opinions on that. So what, what are you doing now? I mean, for the last year or so, everybody's been sort of distributed. I mean, there's this new conference model we have now where it's the massively distributed Um I'm in my kitchen, right? So, you know, you guys are home, everyone's at home. So all the events are online, right? And all the events are virtual. How do you, um, how do you get that same sort of contribution, the same sort of interaction, um, either as a speaker or as a participant as you, it's not the same, obviously, but I mean, how do you sort of compensate for it? Or what you've been, actually, what's your experience been so far? I participated in several online events. Uh, that were regular conferences and that had to go online, of course. Um, I, I think that, and this is exactly in line with, with what we just said a few minutes ago, is that what I'm missing the most is meeting people, sharing a cup of coffee, having a nice, friendly conversation, whether it is technical or not, by the way, it doesn't matter. But I mean, those online contacts are great. And we, if we add on them, it, it would be even worse, but I'm really missing the time where we were able to to just meet in places and stuff. There's a, there's also another aspect that it, that is a big change is that when when you're in a conference venue, I mean you're inside, you you have the feeling to be part of a group, mm. and you're not at home and you're not seeing your family, which is 
kind of sad, of course, but it's only for a few days. Uh, and then being being in a certain place at a certain time with other people that are sharing the same interest than yours, then then it it really creates this kind of feeling that that will that will bring many things um, for for the few days it will last. Mm -hmm. And online events are not really creating this kind of this, this same this same feeling. So. I can't say I'm, I'm I'm happy that they are happening, but I'm really waiting for the situation to be back to normal so that we can yeah. carry on with uh, with real events. So I would add to that a little. Um, I, I mean, I've, I've also I've had I've had mixed experiences of um, of attending online conferences, and sometimes I've not felt them that that wonderful. Uh, I haven't actually presented much at them. J Focus is the first real one that I will have presented at, and and that's I find that that's that's a difficult that's a different and difficult experience. The interaction with the audience not being there, delivering to camera for me is much harder yeah. uh, without without a live audience. But I do see that there are some things. So the the, the virtual conferences I've been to have differed in terms of, for example, there was one I went to that had. Um, uh, kind of a, a, a simulation of the conference entrance hall, and you and a little video where you went and got your ticket validated, and another little video where you went into the the conference room and you saw the backs of the seats, and it did project you to a certain yeah. extent into the conference in, into a conference mode. I think just having the video appear is not. It's really quite difficult to get into that vibe. So another another experiment that I saw was one in which there was a kind of two dimensional map of participants. It was like this was simulating a social event, and this was uh, a technology which meant that that you could hear people uh, the the volume on, of the conversation on the speakers was according to the, how far away or how near you were to them on that map. So if you moved near to a group you would suddenly hear their volume becoming much larger. It sort of simulated the experience. And I found that was very compelling, remarkably, remarkably compelling. And a third thing that, that we tried at the virtual J Alba, which I suspect I'm going to have to repeat this year, was to have different discussion rooms. We broke it, we had different breakout rooms and we used a technology which actually enabled you to see who was in the, 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 the breakout rooms before you went in which is actually an advantage over, uh, over a physical conference. And they, you could also see the discussion board that they were using so that you could, so you could see how is this discussion evolving and am I interested in it to, to, to join it. So I think that although um, virtual conferences, I agree with Jose that there's, there's always, they're always going to lack something, I think as time goes by, they will develop some compensations, which in some cases, like for example, the, the ease of attending them, apart from anything else, yeah. is going to mean that they aren't going to go away. I'm sure that, I'm sure that we will, we're going, if you go jump 10 years into the future, I think virtual conferences will be a thing and they'll be much better than they are now. Yeah, and or some some mix, you know, with the you know yeah. with all the virtual reality, like you just mentioned, uh, and it does absolutely. I've seen some of it. It does you know change your whole you know perception. All right, guys. Well, um, that um, that sounds like it's uh, a good way to you wrap it up for tonight. Um, well, it's actually night for me. It's around midnight. That's almost one. Um, yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, so this is J Focus uh, 2021, and the sincerest form of flattery is your talk. And uh, have a good time at the event, and hope Thank things you. go well. And uh, hopefully, uh, we'll get to see each other um, in person soon. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers. Talk Thank to you. Bye bye. Bye bye.